Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, at least I am for the moment. I will be succeeded next week by Martina Garcia, uh, who will take over, but I'll probably continue to do a few of these videos. Uh, one of my, as it were, um, abiding interests is Greece. I lived in Greece for some years. Uh, I love the country very much, and I love most of the people in it very much. One of the people I really love is George Zavos. George is was the uh, former uh, deputy finance minister responsible for the financial system. When I first met George, he was um, one of Leon Britton's boys in DG15, as was a, a, a very important, I guess, liberalizer within the European financial regulatory framework. He then moved on to be a, an MEP for New Democracy. He became the ambassador, the EU ambassador to Slovakia, uh, an economic, adv uh, a legal advisor in the commission, and ended up as deputy finance minister to the prime minister, um, the prime minister <laughs> Mitsotakis, the current prime minister. Uh, he left that role uh, in the middle of last year. Uh, having implemented one of the most radical uh, debt re restructuring programs that the Europeans have ever known, the Hercules project, the Erebus project, call it what you will. It, it has, I think, been extraordinarily successful. Uh, he's going to explain what he did, why he did it, and whether there are lessons for other European states, particularly weaker Southern European states. But he doesn't get things all his own way. Alex Muscatelli is the director of the Sovereign Group at Fitch Ratings in Frankfurt. Uh, he is the lead analyst for Greece, Spain, Ireland, and a few other countries. He was formerly an economist at the Bank of England. He was also a senior economist at the CBI. Um, but he uh, also doesn't get things all his own way because we have two very distinguished macroeconomists, Peter Sanfi, the deputy director for country economics at the EBRD, a PhD from Yale, and Vicky Price, chief, formerly the chief economic advisor uh, sorry, current, let me, I'm saying this all wrong. Uh, formerly the senior managing director of FTI Consulting, also director general of economics at the uh, Department of Business Innovation and uh, whatever the third one was, joint head of the UK's economic uh, service and a partner and chief economist at KPMG. Most recently, however, chief economic advisor at the CEBR here in London. Uh, everyone gets a chance to, to have their say on this, but we kick off with George. George Zavos, tell us about the Heracles Hercules program. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you very much for your uh, very generous and kind words. Let me say first what have been Hercules' labors. What was the problem? Since 2010, Greece went through one of the most acute economic and financial crises ever witnessed in recent history. Economy contracted to 25% and banks and PLs amounted in March 2016 to 107 billion, that makes 49% of the total loan portfolio. Addressing the explosive NPLs backlog was at the top of the agenda of new democracy government that took office in July 2019. The day I was appointed Deputy Minister for Finance responsible for the financial system, NPLs were at 75.3 billion euros or 43% of the total loan portfolio. Please note, this increase in NPLs occurred despite four recapitalization of the Greek banks for which over 40% of the Greek taxpayers' money was used. My first priority was to design structure, and subsequently negotiate with the EU institutions the Hercules Asset Protection Scheme, a securitization scheme, and following their approval to legislate and implement it immediately. All this happened within a six-month, extremely intense period, a record time for any reform that Greece has seen in its recent history. Hercules was based on the Italian model, CACS, that was adopted three years earlier. However, there were some major differences and important that had to be overcome. First, Italy was an investment grade country while Greece was not and is not yet. Italy had a liquid and has corporate market and Italy's NPL's market was known to the investors. 
Let me tell you now my second point, what we've done so far. Since we are now on a transition from risk to growth, we're really the first time after over 10 years that Greek banks are at an inflection point transitioning towards a balance sheet growth. What we've done in these two years. First, there was a staggering decline of NPLs, and this is mainly due to Hercules scheme. And despite the COVID crisis, Greek NPLs from 43%, I just said in 2019, dropped to 12% uh, percent by last year. Only between June 2019 and June 2021, NPLs declined by 46 billion. The NPL ratio of Greek banks is currently heading to a single digit number for 2022 in a few months. It should reach around 6% on average and move very soon towards 5 to 3%, thereby converging with the EU average. Greek banks boost their capital buffers, and this is happening following their cleanup, and they're already investable. And you have noticed that last year, two of the systemic banks uh, have raised capital through share capital increases over 2 billion. Return on tangible equity heads towards European levels around 7%. Lending growth forecasts are for this year around 6.5 uh, to 7%. Hercules is the main factor behind Greece banks multiple upgrades by credit rating agencies over the last two and a half years. The last upgrade came from Fritz last Friday, whose main director is, is with us. Bank's upgrade is the precursor indicator for Greece's reaching the investment grade. Given Greek economy's dynamic performance, as well as political stability, with an investor-friendly and accommodative government, high-skilled labor force, reinforced by the recent brain gain, one is to expect Greece should attain the investment grade by next year. And as we know, an investment grade would trigger a new wave of investments to further boost uh, Greek economy. It's good also to, to bear in mind that almost exactly a month ago, Jamie Diamond of JP Morgan visited Athens to seal an acquisition of a strategic stake in a Greek unicorn, Viva Wallet. She also announced that JP Morgan will set up in Greece a hub for research and development, what he said in his words around the world, which is, as I understand it, a they want to promote blockchain technology, first within the bank and then across uh, Europe. Some time ago, also Microsoft set up a, a data center in Greece, as well as Pfizer opened its digital hub in Thessaloniki. Let me go now to what I think they're the two most important drivers <clears throat> that uh, be important uh, for, for the future growth of Greek banking system and for uh, Greek uh, economic growth. First, we have an improving microeconomic environment because following the strong growth of 2021, that was 8.5 of the GDP, the European Commission expects, as you know, Greek economy to expand by 4.9 this year and 3.5 next year. Unemployment rate, this morning's uh, data show that last uh, December went down to 12.7% as of 17.3% that was 2019. Greece has also a favorable debt structure with few creditors of the official sector, long maturities, low interest rates that I'm sure Alex uh, will discuss uh, very in detail later. The second important driver for Greek economy is the EU financing, uh, the so-called uh, recovery and resilience uh, funds that we strongly hope that will boost banking Greek bank sector and, and growth. Greek banks, happily enough, are now able to play their role as transmission belts of the recovering and the resilience fund. The so-called RRF is expected to mobilize around 60 billion of investment into the economy over the period 2021 to 2016. How much does Greece qualify to get? Uh, yeah. Greece, exactly, will get 30 billion, 30 billion something, which Andrew uh, makes um, 
18 billion of grants and 13 billion of loans. Greece will give mainly its loans to the private uh, uh, to the private sector that we know there is a, an, an investment a gap. To know also that Greek banks are ready also to put around 30% for the planned investments whereby private investors will come in uh, with 20%. Therefore, and here's a key message, Greek banks must ensure now the timely and effective financing of the real economy. Currently, the big bet of the Greek banks is to channel the available funds and other funds into sustainable investment projects, this including digital investments, green, uh, green finance. Greece also has got an important, as you know, natural alternative energy resources that attract currently uh, considerable investments. In order to achieve this, Greek banks will need absolutely to speed up their own ongoing digital transformation that fits perfectly well with the great success of the digitalization of the Greek public sector. They also, with the state and the other stakeholders, need to build up an innovative uh, ecosystem. Okay, George, you're good. giving us the, yeah. the, the, you know, the public puff for Greece. Let's yeah. let's let's get to the meat of this. I mean, I'm going to I'm going to cut you off, and I'm going to go to Alex. Tell us about the Heracles project. Um, how successful was it? How did they do it? And does it have implications for other EU states? Alex Muscatelli. Uh, th thank you, Andrew. And uh, following on from George, what 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 I would like to uh, focus on for a few minutes is. Uh, so our view of the macroeconomy, our view of the public finances, how they relate to our recent rating actions. Uh, and, uh, and, and this also relates to what, to what, to what George was saying. Um, as he said, we have seen a rapid recovery in the Greek economy. Uh, we do not have the estimate for, for, for the whole year, but uh, full year 2021, we are thinking of 8.3%. And we expect the recovery to continue this year and with the deployment of the European funds gathering pace. Uh, you mentioned the sum of these, um, these amount to around, it's around 10%, the grants component alone is around 10% of 2019 GDP. So this will provide a direct boost to overall demand, especially government spending and investment. And again, domestic demand will be the main driver of an expansion of around 4% in real GDP this year. And we're looking at a similar growth rate for 2023. Although quarterly growth within the year will slow down, uh, will slow down substantially. The, the big uh, uh, pickup in, in activity will be, will be this year. Now, uh, on the public finance side, so we saw in 2021 actually a higher deficit in nominal terms compared to 2020 due to the continuation of the pandemic uh, related support. But what will happen this year? A lot of these support measures will be discontinued. There will be continued growth in GDP and the deficit will fall sharply to around 4% of GDP. And this implies that government debt as a share of GDP peaked in 2020 and will decline over the next few years, but will remain very high at, and we forecast in 2023, 185.3%. Now, part of the story is that Greece will repay outstanding loans from the IMF and prepay the 2022 and 2023 installments of European loans linked to the first financial support program but back in 2010. Now, these payments amount to around 7 billion euros, and we assume that half of this will be run down by, from the cash reserves, so it will also reduce the gross debt stock. And so the combination of a decline in government debt, which was faster than expected, uh, than we previously expected, and stronger growth and a smaller deficit this year, and these were the, was one of the key, key drivers of our decision in mid-January, to revise the outlook on Greece's double B ratings to positive, to positive from stable. Um, the other and, and the other main factor, and uh, as Greece, uh, uh, as George uh, uh, mentioned earlier, was the improvement in asset quality metrics by the systemic Greek banks. Uh, so the, the overall level of, of NPLs fell uh, by, by by around forty billion over the course of one year. 
and the NPL ratio declined to 15% from 36.3. And the Hercules scheme uh, has been a key part of this uh, uh, with, the, with the systemic aid banks uh, implementing securitizations. Now, this provides also a contingent liability for the sovereign in the sense that the envelope of contingent liabilities has increased to 24 billion euros. But at the same time, it, it, it has been a key factor in, in, in the improvement on the asset quality matrix. And turning to the dates, to the date side, so public indebtedness in Greece has risen sharply due to the pandemic, and the debt stock will remain very large for a very long time. And indeed, still in 2023, the debt ratio is forecast to be the second highest of all future-rated sovereigns, and it's three times the median of the, of the double Bs. However, and this is important when discussing Greece, there are mitigating factors that support public debt sustainability. First of all, the liquid asset buffer of the Greek state, which is substantial. The concessional nature of the majority of Greek sovereign debt means that debt servicing costs are low. For example, interest to revenue forecast for this year is 5.6% compared to a, the double B median of 9.7. The, amortiz the amortization schedules are manageable and the average maturity of green debt is, is, the is among the longest of all sovereigns at 20.5 years. And this, together with the fact that the debt stock is almost all at fixed rate, mitigates the risks from rising interest rates. In addition to this, the inclusion of Greek government bonds in the ECB's pandemic emergency purchase program was a, 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 an additional source, an important source of financing flexibility and helped keep bond yields, uh, bond yields, bond yields down. Now, uh, so when we look at the sort of overall rating level of Greece, we have these factors that 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 that, that offset uh, offset one another. On one hand, the very high level of public of the public debt stock, the very high level of MPLs. At the other, on the other hand, we have high income per capita, which exceeds Greece's peer medians, whether they're double B or triple Bs. And the, we have governance scores, human development indicators, among the highest among sub-investment grade countries. Going forward, what does this positive outlook mean? So on the, a positive outlook, uh, a positive outlook means that it is likely that the grading will be upgraded over the next two years. And the factors that could lead to an upgrade are a confidence in the, in, that the firm downward path for the government debt ratio continues, continued progress on asset quality improvement by the systemic banks, and improvement in the medium growth potential and performance, particularly if supported by the NGU funds and other structural reforms. While the, on, on the other hand, the outlook on the rating may be stabilized if we don't see this uh, fall in the debt to GDP ratio in the short term, if we see adverse shocks to the economy or, or uh, adverse developments in the banking sector. Um, I'll, I'll stop here. Well, I'd really want you to explain, I mean, the, the magic of, of, of this, to some extent, depends on the success of the, the success that the Hercules project has actually had. Just explain the mechanism, because this was what I was hoping that both you and George would actually talk about, the mechanism by which if you like, Greek, the, D, the Greek debt problem was transformed. Alex, from the banks, from the from the banks, uh, from the banks' perspectives, uh, it is as George mentioned, creating, uh, um, developing this sort of market for for MPLs within within Greece. Uh, from the sovereign perspective, from the sovereign perspective, it is. It is a, a, a balanced view in the sense, on one hand, we, we, see, we see a sharp decline in, uh, in MPLs, and this means that uh, the, Greek bank, the Greek banking sector is, is, is able to lend uh, to, function, to function better, and the Greek, bank, and the Greek banks are, are less of a, of a contingent liability for the sovereign. At the same time, we do see, inevitably, just by, by, by construction, the Hercules scheme creates 
uh, 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 creates sovereign guarantees. And so there may be contingent liabilities coming through. It, it will depend a lot on whether we see new inflows of MPLs coming through post pandemic in this normalization when uh, 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 government support and, uh, and subsidies, interest subsidies um, uh, uh, come to an end. How important will the NPLs, will the, will the new inflows of NPLs be? So um, there is a more nuanced view on our, on our side, but the but the overall uh, impact from our assessment is is, is uh, of the but surely surely the risk has just been shifted from the from the private to the public sector, hasn't it, George? I, I, if, I, if I can, come, because that's an important point, sir, to clarify, uh, then you give me exactly the, uh, I mean, the possibility to, to explain a little bit about Hercules. What is Hercules? It's a securitization scheme, therefore an SPV that has bought banks and PLs. Mm -hmm. What the Greek state guarantees is only a part of the whole transaction. Mm -hmm which is a so-called senior tranche, which the best part, which is rated by credit uh, rated agencies and is the most, the, the most solid part. Um, as uh, Alex said, uh, there is only a contingent liability, which means a liability that is not written in the public debt. There is only liability if ever were to have a call of the guarantee which is a long distance, as you know, possibility, given the all known factors. First, Italians for five years, there's no call uh, of, their, uh, of their guarantee. All the, the prospects of uh, the market are currently going from, uh, to a very good direction, meaning that we have already developed a secondary NPLs market, mm -hmm. uh, which amounts to over uh, 100, bi 100 billion servicers market. And as I know very well, almost 95% of the transactions have already been uh, securitized. This gives a boost also to the real estate market. Given also something which is very important, the growth perspectives of the Greek economy, I think that's the best uh, advice if you want for cleaning up the NPLs from uh, the, the economy, not only moving them out of the bank's balance sheets, but moving it out of the economy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, any kind of call-in becomes only a very, very distant and remote uh, probability. And I would say something else, and now it's a good your question. If you see the structure of the guarantee that follows an EU template, so it's a number of things that provide very important safeguards uh, for the Greek states. What it is, first of all, that guarantees only the best part of the transaction. Secondly, in order to guarantee uh, the, the, this transaction, it has to be a market of selling over 50% of the mezzanine and the junior, which is important. Thirdly, even if ever were the possibility of any call-in that's already priced in the premium. And to tell you something else, we have already uh, set in place a monitoring committee that takes care of the recoveries. Recoveries are doing pretty well uh, right now. There's a great demand, especially since, as you know, most recoveries are securitized with mortgages and these mortgages only can uh, go up. Uh, within the securitization structure, the guarantee, you've got also a liquidity buffer that is there uh, to cover uh, any uh, shortfalls in terms of recovery. So you understand, we're talking one of the best types of guarantees with practically, I would say, currently, as we, we've seen in the two most successful experiments of, uh, of securitization in Europe that we have no call uh, so, so far. This is very important to, 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 to make it clear because what happens in Italy happens also uh, in, in, in the Greek case. Right, of course. I mean, I was looking at the spreads, uh, Greek debt over German bonds. It's come out to what, 231 basis points today. So the, the spreads have been widening. That doesn't concern you, George? So, you know, uh, what, uh, what we've said before, you know, and I think uh, um, uh, Alex has, has given, I think, a very good, uh, a very good reply. In fact, 
the Greek depth, uh, Greek depth uh, structure is very favorable. You've got the very long uh, maturities over 20 years, fixed low uh, uh, rates, limited foreign currency exposure, elevated debt ownership by the, the official sector. And I would say also that the Greek debt it has its specificity. That is what I would call immunized debt in the sense that has the characteristics that we've talking to bankers, banks balance sheets is kind of equity. Uh, sovereigns hold the debt, therefore there's no immediate, uh, I would say danger for any uh, call in. Low uh, dividends and uh, as I said, there's a duration of over uh, 20 years uh, and that makes it probably Greek debt, as you know, one of the best around the you know around the globe that's something uh, to confirm yeah. okay alex quickly and then i'm going to bring peter yes just, just to come in uh, just to come in on this I, I think from our from our perspective the things i probably worry most about are the risk of persistence of high deficits if the government yeah you know the the, the, the government has been very very uh, uh, proactive in, in in helping the economy through the pandemic uh, in its support, um, the risk of persistence of these, uh, and, and really the risk of growth dynamics uh, petering out and uh, and bringing out, let's say, unfavorable growth interest dynamics uh, uh, over, over the medium term. So uh, I, th I think those are the more uh, are, are the key are the key things that the, 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 that I worry about on the interest rates. Uh, uh, on the uh, on rising bond yield, bond spreads, and, and, and interest rates, um, as as we have we have we have mentioned, Greece's debt service over the next two years, as a share of revenues, we estimated it will be lower than Italy's or Spain's, just because of various various factors. So the rise of interest rates, we have to see how this translates to Greek households and Greek, Greek businesses, but. It's, it isn't something that, that worries me particularly in terms of the debt service of the Greek sovereign. So, it do, so the higher interest rates worry me, but through the channel of the economy, of the real economy. And okay, Peter. Peter, let's bring, bring in Peter. Peter Stanfield. Too much, Andrew. So from an EBRD perspective, uh, I, I think we share the broadly positive sentiment that we've heard from our previous speakers, from George and, and from uh, Alex. And by the way, perhaps I should say at the start that uh, some of your viewers might be a little puzzled. If they haven't been paying attention to Greece in recent years, they may wonder why is the EBRD involved? And, and you know, we were an institution set up for ex-communist countries and so on. But uh, we have been given a special mandate to operate in Greece since 2015. It was initially a five-year mandate, and now it's been extended to 2025. And in fact, this is now one of our biggest countries of operations. We have a cumulative business investment of 5.5 billion euros over this uh, seven-year period, uh, 838 million euros invested just last year in 27 projects. So it's one of our most important countries, and it's one of the countries we we, we pay most attention to. Uh, and the first thing I want to say uh, about the improving scenario is that at the core of it has been the improvement in the financial sector. In fact, our first operations in Greece in 2015 were to be part of the recapitalization of the four systemic banks. And really, when you look back at 2015, which I think was really the nadir of the Greek crisis uh, and, and, and for the financial sector, which was in a total mess, and looked at now, the, the, the improvement has really mm. been quite, quite dramatic. And, and, and the George and Alex have spelled out some of the statistics, the non-performing loans in particular, coming down from what was it, 43% to now 12% and, and, and well on target for single digit figures this year. Uh, what, what, what's also impressed us uh, and, and enabled us to do more business is the uh, the rolling out of new products by some of the banks. So not only are they back on their feet, but they're looking at working with us and others on uh, you know synthetic bonds. Uh, last year we we worked with Alpha Bank and Eurobank on senior preferred bonds. Uh, there are new financial other new financial products coming to the market as well, particularly to do with the the non-performing loan segment and linked to the, the Hercules scheme, which uh, we very much 
uh, support. So I, I think all of that really is a, a transformation. And if you get the financial sector right, then the economy can, can follow as well. Now, if I can just say a, a couple of words on how we see the economy. So uh, I think we have been uh, surprised on the upside on the resilience of the Greek economy in the last couple of years and, and on the strength of the bounce back from the, the COVID crisis, which really hit Greece very hard, of course, with its service dependent economy, tourism and so on. Uh, so in, in October, we had uh, we had projected 7% growth for 2021. We haven't seen the final agreed figures yet, but it looks like we'll be closer to 9%, somewhere between 8.5 and, uh, and, and 9%. For 2022, we, uh, we had projected then 3.9%. Now that looks maybe like being on the conservative side, and, and we will publish new forecasts in, in, in May, which... Uh, right now, I would expect to be maybe a little bit on, uh, higher than that. And uh, two other figures we look at closely, because I think they're a very, indica very good indication of where we might be going. Economic sentiment, which in January is at a 21-year high, um, and the, the PMI, the Purchasing Managers Index, is also at uh, historical highs. So uh, if, you, if you put that together with the, the the hard data on GDP, on, on industrial production, on unemployment, which is falling steadily. Uh, I think there is, uh, there is a very good story to tell, especially when you take into account the, uh, the EU support that is coming that, that, George, that George mentioned and uh, Alex also, the, the 31 billion uh, from the RRF. Uh, and by the way, we at the EBRD were, uh, were very impressed with the professionalism of the, the Greek authorities in, they were one of the first countries to put together a very coherent program based on very good uh, uh, analysis of, the, of the, the needs of the economy, of the, of, of the demands. Um, and, and we at the EBRD are, are very happy to be Partnered with this program, uh, and when we will be uh, we will be participating alongside the banks and, and others in in some of these uh, loans. Now, if if I can maybe uh, highlight one or two of the risks. So we, we've heard a lot about the the debt situation. I think Alex has explained it very well, and we we fully support this the, that uh, analysis. I would mention uh, we haven't yet mentioned. I think the word governance. Uh, but I think uh, improving governance, uh, I know when the new government came in in 2019, uh, it, it, this was put very much at the heart of their program. Uh, uh, I remember going to a presentation by the, the chief advisor to the prime minister who, who strongly emphasized governance as being something they really wanted to uh, focus on. Uh, and I think there, there have been improvements in, in, in particularly in, in public sector, public administration, public sector governance. But it's still, uh, I would say, an area where Greece lags behind uh, others. And, and to back that up, uh, I would cite some in-house research we do at the EBRD, published in our annual transition report, where we, we, we construct indexes of various qualities of a market economy uh, in, for all of the countries we're investing, but also for advanced countries. So we look at we have a competitive index, we have one on green economy, inclusion, resilience, integrated, but also governance. And it's in governance where the gap between Greece and the most advanced countries is, is still highest. And, and therefore, I think one an, an area that, that, that will need further attention. So, so to summarize, I think uh, a, a positive fi picture, a good time to invest in Greece, uh, we will remain very active there with investments until the end of 2025, uh, but but still, you know, considerable challenges ahead. Let me just ask you though. In general, your your uh, the Greeks did a really good job in restructuring their debt, and you support entirely the the Hercules program. And I mean, does it? Do you feel that it has broader applicability in other countries? Uh, Yes, I think so. And in fact, the program itself, I think, uh, uh, as George mentioned, was, was similar to the Italian program. So I think it is a model that when you, when you, when you get into a, a, very, uh, a, a very weak and a very dangerous situation, as Greece had done with the uh, NPLs being almost half of the portfolio, 
then uh, I, I think a program like this uh, now we can say, I think, uh, has a sort of proven uh, success. The, the, and, and the risks are very much mitigated, the risks for the sovereign, as, as, as George was, uh, was, just, was just explaining. Okay, Vicky, you're sort of a Greek, exoteric Greek, um, who has a sort of objective view of your uh, mother country. Um, do you share the, the general optimism uh, about, about Greece? And specifically, do you share the feeling, I think, that the, the Hercules project was, was pretty much a roaring success and you know, has made many of the other changes in Greece's economic outlook possible? Yes, but I think what um, perhaps is even more important is the way in which the European Central Bank, as has already been mentioned, uh, has been buying Greek bonds, um, which of course it wasn't allowed to do and isn't really allowed to do under its normal remit. But there's been a waiver uh, which has allowed for that to happen for the moment. Of course, that waiver is about to expire, but I think there's a now ex an expectation with a bit of luck that this is going to carry on for a little bit longer, maybe to 2025. It'd be interesting to see you know, whether that materializes. So I think that's a very, very important part of what's been going on in Greece, what has kept, in fact, bond rates low. Yes, of course, Recently, the the uh, the gap between you know German bonds and and uh, Greek bonds has widened, uh, but nevertheless, Greece has been able to borrow at historically low levels of interest rate for uh, quite some time now. And I think the ECB actions have been particularly important. And I think my view is that uh, if only the the COVID crisis happened before the financial crisis when, of course, everything was so tightened by the Europeans and the IMF. Um, and it's one of the reasons, I presume, why uh, EBRD finally went in and gave some assistance. And I remember going to the EBRD and having discussions before they set up their, their office there. Um, it really was because Greece was suffering so significantly at the time. And if, it, if there hadn't been this very considerable tightening on Greece, the sort of turning of the screw, if you like, um, uh, at the time, of course, we'd be in a very different situation now. But right now, of course, with COVID, the mantra is borrow, borrow, borrow um, for as long as you possibly can. Um, if you've got the sort of space to do so and continue to help the, the economy and a lot of liquidity has been thrown into the system, uh, which has helped Greece very substantially. And so this is really the difference that has taken place. Of course, the balance sheets of the banks had to be sorted out because the NPLs were so high. And of course, selling off those loans, if you like, is, is, is a good thing. Um, but what we need a Greek banking system for, which of course, as we know, has been consolidated to a very significant extent. We now only have four systemic banks. You can control them a lot more easily. You know what's going on. Um, and just a few non-systemic ones. Uh, we want them to start lending properly to the economy. For the moment, if you look at the data, which is quite confusing, there's quite a lot of repayments that are happening. So, and deposits are quite high because people haven't been spending an awful lot during the pandemic. Um, but the overall net lending figure isn't particularly high. What you need is a lot more liquidity to go into the economy to finance all the things we want to do. And yes, of course, we're going to get the money coming in from the EU, which will be important. The banks are going to contribute to this, but the more general uh, support that is needed in the economy uh, needs to come from the banks as well. And the, the improvement in their rating is good news. Uh, if they can reduce the, 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 uh, the capital ratios, that's all, also going to be quite good. So they can do a little bit more of that, of that lending. So uh, we need to have a banking system that seriously contributes to the growth of the economy in the future. And of course, we also need a banking system that can make some profits in the future. And yes, we're talking about long-term rates going up, but the actual interest rates that are charged by the banks are still, I think, considered by most of them as being quite low, allowing them to make the profits that they need to be making. So that's another issue that we need to look at if we want to ensure sustainability of the banking system in the future and continued interest, if you like, in uh, in uh, activity in Greece. Uh, so, um, yes, of course, positive stuff, but we started from a very low base and we started mm -hmm. after years of serious uh, non-support, if you like, 
mm. for for the banking uh, system, which is a worry. And then the final thing I would say is, yes, of course, the economy, I think that's brilliant. It's been generally understood, of course, that the Southern European countries have um, suffered most from the pandemic because of tourism and, and so on. Tourism is, is picking up. Some of the other sectors are picking up, which is all good news. Uh, innovation, investment in various areas, as we've been hearing, is beginning to happen. You know, Google, et cetera, quite a lot of tech activity going on and digital activity going on in Greece. But if you look at GDP per head, um, before the recent recovery, if you like, in 2021, we were still something like 30% below, if I read the figures correctly, of where we were in the US dollar terms in 2010. So we're talking about a country which is the poorest still per capita in Europe uh, after, I think, Bulgaria. Um, so um, there is a lot to be done still, and a lot of recovery still to happen. And the banking system is going to be absolutely crucial in that. And uh, I just worry about some of the issues that I just mentioned, that it may not be able to play quite the role that we'd like it to. But obviously, the EBRD support is also a seriously essential. And from what I understand, it will continue now until 2025, at least, uh, again, which is good news. Can, can I just ask George to come back on that? I mean, the, you, you're, you're very positive on the uh, new as it were, the new world that the Greek banks are moving into. You're very positive about yes, the role. Yes, I'm very positive, but I take also, I would say, Vigit's point, and I said before, that their Greek bank's single mission right now is really to expand lending. I know that's not easy. They've, they've put behind already some of the most important legacy issues I just mentioned. However, now they need to focus much more on lending and Andrew, what, not is for real that, what is the real problem? The real problem is that you have to find small and medium-sized enterprises that we had called, they are not, you know, well, you know, from other country experience, they are not always bankable, so it's not easy. But the big challenge now, stemming especially from the EU funds, is this double transformation, as I said, of the banking system and of the productive sector that should be happen through especially incentives tax incentives that the government, you know, uh, gives for financing small and medium-sized enterprises. Let me say very quickly, since uh, one point regarding Alex, um, uh, Alex ob observation about uh, fiscal deficits, I would say that we know the Greek government is not a secret, is really determined to keep fiscal discipline, not only through the crisis, but uh, in the years uh, to come. For uh, Peter, uh, that uh, has got another point regarding governance, I would say two points. Point one, regarding a public sector, already a widespread digitalization of the public sector has happened. That helps a lot. We haven't done everything, but already it's a big step. The other issue, very dear to my heart, is corporate governance. That's why back in June 2020, I passed a very important, you know, through the parliament, a very important law regarding corporate governments. Therefore, if you want restructuring, capital markets, stock uh, exchange, that we think should be next launching pad for, uh, for investments. Uh, regarding, uh, I would say, the Peter's other points about Hercules being a model, I strongly believe it, because Greece has a know-how, a template, of how, I would say, small other countries, European, non-Europeans, could use it in terms, you know, of they face a peak of, uh, uh, of, of NPLs. Still, Hercules carries some very important messages for the EU, meaning that it is a very uh, interesting uh, structure, a very important tool for risk reduction, risk diversification, and so, so, also how you can solve through the capital markets union instruments, important problems of the banking of the banking union. Therefore, I think there's a strong message against to the EU that need to deepen further the tools we have uh, in the in the capital uh, in the capital markets. Um, so let me let me let me stop here. Well, let me ask Peter. I mean, Greece always had a. I mean, it was a, a country built on SMEs, built on on 
particularly on small enterprises, but also on medium-sized enterprises. And they've obviously been hurt very, very badly during the pandemic. I mean, can you can you see a, 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 a way in which the recovery of the SME sector can be accelerated? I mean, is that a major concern for the EBRD? Uh, it is, but uh, there's a limit to what we can do directly. So our financing for SMEs tends to be indirect because it's it's not uh, it's not efficient for us to give very small loans directly. That's why we work closely with the banks. We work closely with all four systemic banks, and and we're working with them to strengthen their capital bases and on on some of these new products. And we worked with we we have worked and we will continue to work with uh, equity funds, uh, venture capital, and, and and so on. So all of those I think will indirectly feed through to the uh, SME sector. There's uh, but, a danger. But, isn't, isn't there a danger, though, that, you know, the, the, the easiest lending in Greece is real estate lending? Um, you know, you'll just push up the price of real estate and, and those who really need the money won't get it. That is a danger. But, you know, we, 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 we are really working hard to try and, uh, you know, make sure that this lending actually goes to, to the real economy. And, and we combine some of our working with the banks and other financial institutions with uh, we have a, a, a donor funded advisory service which also gives very hands-on advice to businesses on how to uh, how to model their business plans and and, and so on so uh, you know we, we uh, there's a limit to, as i say to what we can do i mean we're very proud of what we've done so far and are doing but uh you know a lot of it is really down to the bigger picture of the the, the bank and, and george's well. point about the digitalization of the uh, of the greek economy i mean i've never met a stupid greek in my life and they are the most numerous people in europe um and you know one assumes jamie diamond being of course the greek american of choice um you know they are both very good at finance and very good at technology um are you encouraged by the digitalization of the Greek economy? I mean, is it progressing as fast as George would suggest? I, I, the yeah, public, uh, I said also, yeah. the, sorry, of the Greek public sector, Andrew, which has been really, uh, that's, a, that's a great success, uh, success story. And to add to this also that the EU uh, finance RRF is conditioned upon investment on digital projects and green projects. Therefore, they're forced everybody to do, you know, its proper homework and deliver in the very near future. Exactly, there's a certain percentage allocated for digital projects, which, uh, and that's of great interest to us because it's one of, the, it's one of uh, we have three core priorities for all our countries. There's green, there's inclusion, and there's digital. Uh, and and uh, absolutely, uh, I think Greece is a country of great potential in that area. On, on that, Vicky, I mean, you, you've written on all three of those. <laughs> but on, uh, Greece is a sort of, you know, the, the digitalization of both the public sector and, I guess, the private sector as well. Is it, um, uh, are you encouraged as well? Yes, I think there have been lots of changes. But um, on the on the odd occasion when I need something done in Greece, you still have to go at some point physically and show various papers and do various things. So there's still a long way to go. Uh, but it's been very fast, actually, the change that's taken place. But if you start from quite a low base, then uh, you know you can't expect miracles. So I think that has been a very positive step. And I, I think it's also hugely important for productivity for the Greek economy. It would be also interesting, it's what you said, Andrea, about lots of SMEs. I mean, there's been a problem in Greece that we don't have the big sort of manufacturing companies Um coming in and employing lots of people and also, of course, with it, introducing quite a lot of technologies in there too. So you do end up, unfortunately, with loads of startups. There's a lot of interest in those startups from foreign firms, including American firms that are moving in. But there's also a big movement right now in with organizations like Reload Greece to see how you can put together entrepreneurs from uh, the West, if you like, certainly in the UK, and Greece and learn from each other. So this knowledge exchange is a seriously important part of what I think Greece needs to do to, to move up. I, I am very optimistic about what, what the Greeks, as you de define them, Andrew, can achieve um, if that bureaucracy that we still see being there is eased. And I think although I agree entirely that digitalization helps up to a point, there's also a mindset uh, making it easier for setting up uh, in Greece. And also, of course, having access 
to those loans that we've just been discussing and how difficult or easy that is, uh, is going to determine, I think, quite a lot of what happens in Greece in the future. Fewer small envelopes will be passed around, uh, we hope. I mean, is, is, is that sort of petty corruption still a problem in the bureaucracy in Greece, in your opinion, Vicky? Um, there is a certain amount of that, but of course, you know, remember um, quite a lot, for example, of the of the health service is supposed to be free. But in order to make sure that you get attention from the person you want to do the operation, then you do hand something over, mainly as a, as a little gift of, um, of, of gratefulness, if you like. Um, but yes, I think there is a lot of that still going on, but that is because the state hasn't quite been able to perhaps invest sufficiently in areas where that provision should really be free for the public. Sure. If, if I can say only one word, uh, but we're going to talk about everything. There are all, many, many reforms that have uh, happened the last two and a half years in Greece regarding all areas, I would say, of the economy, including uh, health, uh, pension fund systems, uh, single licensing, uh, great transparency. Having in mind also that digitalization means you slash the red tape. You really you combat any type you know of of, of 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 corruption, and therefore with the reforms that already been adopted, they're ongoing. Uh, there is a great hope also that whatever even you know sources uh, of uh, disruption existed there, you know that will be uh, that will be uh, that that will be finished. Uh, my final word is uh, I would say that you've seen that Hercules has done the heavy lifting of the Greek banking system, the Greek economy in really very hard times. By the end of the day, is only uh, a, a semi-god. There is a lot of work obviously to be done, but there is a great and real genuine prospects for Greece really becoming, I would say, the wunderkinder of the Eurozone, you know, uh, in, the years, in the years to come, especially by using uh, technology and even small scale that they are now becoming uh, very important competitive features of any economy. Thank you. Okay, that's the, that's the optimistic. That is the optimistic view of the future. What are the major risks? I'm going to ask the other three speakers to, to say what could go wrong. Alex, first of all, what could go wrong? Uh, I think on the growth prospects and the growth dynamics, well, we're seeing the risks play out today. And I think, first of all, high inflation and the way it will it, it will affect uh, households, real incomes, business costs. May, this may have an impact on growth uh, in, in the short term. So some of the, the positive growth dynamics that, that most people are expecting might, uh, might be weaker. Um, further out, uh, the med on the medium term growth uh, is, um, let's say, a less effective deployment uh, uh, of EU funds and, uh, and less effective implementation of reforms means that the, the, the medium term, the, the growth rate at which the Greek economy can grow sustainably in the future uh, may, be, may, may, may be weaker. Um, where we're we're we 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 are living through geopolitical through heightened geopolitical well, that's, tensions. That's something. Is, uh, is, Greece, uh, is Greece vulnerable, particularly on the energy front, to what's happening in Ukraine and in Russia? Uh, on the uh, Greece imports uh, uh, of Greece's natural gas imports, around 40, 40 to forty five percent, I think, come from Russia. Um, at the same time, natural gas isn't a, a, a particularly high share of overall energy production and energy supply as it comes down. So, so there is. So yes, there is a there is a vulnerability there. Uh, there are also other other, other sources uh, of, of 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 gas and energy. Vicky, what do you, what do you see as the main risks going forward? Well, apart from those short-term ones, uh, and of course, there is also a move to. Um, no longer um, use link or be reliant on lignite, for example. I think the government right now is moving that direction. Um, for the medium term, what I worry about is the EU attitude. I mean, the um, Stability and Growth Pact, of course, which has been uh, sort of set aside for the time being, um, is being worked on. So what's going to happen next? One hopes that, in fact, it will be 
it will be set aside for a little bit longer. It's being discussed right now. Uh, there are some moves to go back to stricter rules. What Greece will do with the current debt GDP ratio it has, I don't know. So I'm worried a little bit about that. We may be living through a, a nice period post COVID where we can still carry on as we are in Greece or, or Greece can carry on as it is. Uh, getting all that support, but um, what I think will be very important on the on the uh, financial side is that uh, Fitch upgrades the banks a bit more at some point, mm -hmm. so that they have investment grade status. So there isn't an issue about QE, but of course, even QE uh, and what the therefore the ECB does is slowing down, will be slowing down in the future. So that may not provide quite the type of support that we'd like it to. But of course, Greece is still quite a small uh, part of this whole enterprise with ECB. So those two things are there. Yes, of course, Alex was talking about the economy more generally. And you know, you've seen prices of electricity go up very significantly. And if you look at what uh, the figures are saying year on year, uh, in terms of getting into the consumer price index that has just come out, um, I think electricity prices have gone up by something like 53%. Uh, households now, I have heard stories, Andrew, I'm sure you you recognize some of that, where people in blocks of flats just don't pay the communal electricity because they can't afford it. So therefore, the lifts don't work. So you talked about the real estate sector. Nobody wants to live from floor four and above. Or, um, so there is going to be a problem in terms of real disposable incomes for a while uh, that needs to be seriously addressed, I think, by, by the government, the banks and so on in anything they do in terms of the support that they provide. The final word is with you, Peter. What what do you see the risks, the main risks going forward as being? I think all of the above, but maybe a few others. Uh, COVID, of course, um, in the short term, a new you know new variants, uh, a new variant that was much more dangerous than Omicron. That would you know that could again temporarily kill any appetite for for travel and tourism. Um, Geopolitical tensions were mentioned. I mean, uh, the, you know, Turkey, uh, the Greece-Turkey relations are always a bit fraught and, you know, subject to the sudden deterioration. Uh, but longer term, two issues, uh, demography. So Greece's very low birth rate is bad for long term growth prospects unless either the, the birth rate uh, rises or, or and or Greece takes in more uh, immigration. Uh, and climate change. So, if if the world can't really get a handle on that, if if, if temp global temperatures rise, then then Greece and that that southeastern European European region is is really vulnerable to severe climate changes, which uh, would would be very damaging to to the economy. On that cautionary note, can I thank George? Can I thank Alex, Peter and Vicky and, of course, all of you for watching. I think this was a generally very optimistic look. And, and what can I say, George? Well done with the Hercules project. Many thanks to all of you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Wishing you really the best into your new challenges. You've done a great job, as you know, for this uh, CFI. You turned it into a real institution. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still available for new jobs. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>